Hey folks, and welcome to this week's video narration recording. This one is a story that is in the very early stage draft period. I actually just finished this about two, three days ago, so, and I figured it would be kind of interesting for you to see how I do kind of a work in progress. Um, this is what I feel is complete enough that I can just do a few drafts and copy editing stuff. So uh, without further ado, this is Dead Cakes and Appetizers. I opened the fridge and the first thing I saw placed between a red plastic bowl filled with coleslaw and a six pack of diet soda was grandma's face staring back at mine like those wall-eyed fish you find under glass at the grocery store at deli counter. It had taken us three days to get her down to this point, beginning with the feet and working our way upwards as we had. Now all that was left was this section above the collar and the left hand sliced above the wrist, minus a pinky. Uncle Bill had said that the flavor of this piece had been oddly sour compared to the rest of the body, and he was worried that it had might have gone bad somehow. He always did have a weak constitution, a fact that he was inclined to remind us before, after, and during every meal, but had prom promised that he had, would finish what he'd started once his heartburn had settled down. We all knew that he was a devout hypochondriac, and that Cousin James or Aunt Marcia would have to finish his portion for him now that he'd gone back to the Bay Area. Them, or more likely, me. As the oldest daughter of the new matriarch of the family, I'd taken it upon myself to eat a foot, half a forearm, and part of her left breast. This was so that those of us who were watching our weight or had the odd health condition could have smaller portions and still feel like they had contributed. I'd done much the same when Aunt Deb and her, uh, had had her sudden heart attack and when Reese fell off that cliff during his spring break to Australia. After Reese, my family gave me the nickname Sweet Tooth Cindy, and it stuck. From then on, it became an unspoken rule that if you couldn't finish your plate or your gut was acting up, you could rely on me to pick up the slack. I wouldn't be surprised if they were waiting me, for me to polish off Grandma like I uh, off with an evening cup of coffee that night, in fact. Actually, that might just be what I'd do now that the thought had dug its way out of my brain. Stuff like that always tasted better with coffee as a chaser. But in the meantime, I reached over Grandma's unblinking face and grabbed the container of boiled baby carrots uh, that had been squirreled away in the back of the shelf. Despite my careful efforts, one corner of the Tupperware bumped into Grandma's gray locks, dragging away a line uh, as I brought them out. I glared at the evidence of my clumsiness, then shrugged my shoulders, ran my finger across the plastic container to wipe it clean, and popped it into my mouth. The taste of dark chocolate and a subtle hint of mint was sweet and refreshing as it had been for the first bite of the dead cake as the frosting melted on my tongue. I closed the door to the fridge and returned to my room to continue playing video games with my younger sister, Michelle, our snack in hand. Grandma's passing had been especially hard on Michelle, close as the two of them had been. Escaping into some high fantasy sword and sorcery games had been doing her some good, when all you had to worry about was making your badass barbarian sorceress better dressed than the queen regent and finding herbs to plant around your potion garden, the harsh edges of reality could be dulled a bit and better worked through. Why not try that lakeside innkeeper with the lisp, I offered. Didn't he have that cool dragon scale shawl for sale yesterday? Michelle raised an eyebrow, uh, which disappeared under her auburn bangs. He said he'd only sell it once I'd finished those trade negotiations with the trolls, remember? I smacked my head. Right! Totally forgot about that. Well, might as well do that then, now that we have that charisma potion all finished. I guess, was her half-hearted response. The game's ambient exploration music was the only sound in the bedroom for a while as Michelle navigated to the next task. Eventually, Michelle broke the silence. So, is it going to happen tonight or tomorrow? Probably tonight, I said, 
It usually takes about a full week. But since she passed around midnight, the timing can be a little off. Mom said that her own grandpa was a day earlier than everyone expected, and it had interrupted someone having set uh, a slumber party. She nodded in understanding. Yeah, that would be pretty surprising if you weren't expecting it for a whole nother day. That's what I hear, I said, glad that I dodged that birds and the bees bullet. I was sure that my Michelle, being 14 and attending a public school, probably already knew more about sex uh, and what went into it than any typical sex ed class led on. But she wasn't about to plow, but I wasn't about to plow headlong into that landmine of awkwardness uh, if I uh, happened to be wrong about that. Michelle's barbarian reached the troll's lair and started hacking out a few offers that the trolls countered with their own haggling. It took a few tries in the stealthy addition of the charisma potion, but eventually a deal was struck and the cultural exchange achievement popped up on the screen's monitor. I reached for another carrot out of the Tupperware, only to find that we'd mindlessly eaten the whole lot while Michelle was gaming. My stomach, always a bottomless pit at this time of the day, despite my slim frame, growled its annoyance at an offering. It insisted that coffee and cake was in order, or there would be hell to pay in the form of hangriness and a mind headache. Lifting myself off the bed was double it, uh, that was doubling as a couch for the time being, I asked Michelle if she'd like to split a fresh pot of, uh, of coffee and the rest of grandma with me. I immediately regretted the impulse as my sister's face went from amused interest in the game to somber in no time flat. Hey, I said, touching her arm in reassurance and taking a knee to be at eye level in front of her. It's okay. I know, I know. Michelle's voice was half broken, but she managed to keep uh, from letting the dam break. Taking a deep breath that seemed to calm her uh, fraction, she continued, I just, I miss her, you know. And I know that it's just cake mix and frosting, but every time I see it, I'm reminded that she's gone. The dam finally began to spring a leak. First one tear, then two. But she's not really gone, Michelle. That's what's cool about it, yeah? About us. I could see that my words were having little effect. So instead, I tried another tactic. How about I pre-slice it up uh, before you come down to the kitchen, hmm? That way it'll be just a big clump of uh, chocolate mint deliciousness. Michelle brushed away the wetness from her cheeks, took another deep breath, then laughed softly. No, no, I'm being ridiculous. That's what it's there for, right? To help people get over this kind of stuff? Progress the grieving process and all that? I'll be fine. And yeah, coffee and cake sounds great. I gave Michelle a reassuring smile and led her down to the kitchen. Now, don't get me wrong. Internally, I was an emotional mess. After all, when someone who you've talked to, laughed with, lived with, almost every day of your li entire life was suddenly gone, it leaves a hole in your chest the size of Los Angeles. When you have someone like, say, a younger sister who hasn't experienced first-hand death before, you need to be that solid rock of strength and logic that they can use to get some emotional footing. We sat down beside one another at the round oak dining table. As we drank our coffee and ate the sweet remains of our grandmother's image, I laid, down, uh, laid out to Michelle our family history surrounding this ritual. She'd never really heard much about it, except in passing, and even those parts had been glossed over. Even so, there really wasn't anything secretive or inherently occult behind it. It was just something that happened, regardless of whether we wanted it to or not. Sure, back in the day, our family had been part of the church, and a few of us had been uh, trying our hand at being healers. A few more had been pretty good at fortune telling, too. But nothing was ever really serious or dark artsy about it. It wasn't until one of our financially broke but undeniably creative ancestors tried their hand at sin eating as a means to get some free food and wine while providing a civil service 
that the idea stuck and became part of our family tradition. As far as anyone can tell or remember, that's when the visitations became more consistent and predictable. No more of this random materialization that could interrupt something important, make it embarrassing, or unintentionally cause another funeral. We could all be reasonably confident that about seven days after a wake and eating the departed symbolic dead cake, that the departed themselves would make their appearance. No one was, uh, no one knew exactly uh, how our family picked up this sensitivity, as our uncle Dave likes to call it, but we can all agree that it it's always been this way for us. There were a few who claimed that they're, they've never received a visitation of any kind, that the trait must have apparently skipped them by. And while that very well might be, uh, I have a theory that these outliers are either just unlucky with the timing or are completely oblivious. Like Aunt Ruby, who rescued that abandoned puppy while she was found on a walk and then uh, which turned out to be a coyote. She still thinks that it's just a wolf mix breed and that we're just teasing her when we bring it up. Michelle stopped me at this point with a raised hand. Hold on. Even Aunt Ruby can't miss having a dead relative suddenly come back. I mean, she's not that airheaded. I shrugged. Maybe she slept through them. That CPAP she uses that sounds like Darth Vader having an asthma attack in a wind tunnel is pretty loud. Or maybe she was watching reality TV. A bomb could go off in her living room and she wouldn't notice if somebody walked in, spiritualized and all that. Yeah, I guess you're right about that. Back to the dead cake stuff, though. Why'd Grandma choose mint chocolate? I mean, not complaining. It's one of my favorites and all. But does the flavor matter? In a way. But the type and flavor of the cake doesn't mean so much as the amount you eat. It acts as a kind of incentive or deterrent for some people who have more or less. The bigger piece of dead cake you eat, the stronger or longer lasting the visitation will be. Grandma knew you and I love those mint chocolate chip cookies and such, so I can guarantee that that's why she picked that flavor. I laughed. Heck, she might have done it knowing Uncle Bill thinks mint is poisonous after he read that article and wouldn't stop talking about it last Thanksgiving. Win-win there, since she's always found that annoying about him. Reese even had his be carrot cake, knowing that everyone in the family except his sister hates it, and that most of us are too prim and proper not to partake. One last laugh for him, I guess. Michelle sat in silence for a moment, mulling things over. So, no visitation for people who don't eat any of the cake, then? Not necessarily, I said. Most of the time, yeah, but sometimes it just happens, regardless. Cousin Rich was stuck in Tokyo on that long business trip when Pappy passed, and he still showed up in the hotel room where Rich had been staying. No one's figured out why that happens, except that it might have something to do with the particular headspace you're in. Rich said he'd just started watching Jaws when Pappy suddenly popped up on the couch next to him, and he figured that it was because they uh, that was their shared favorite movie. Who's to say, except them, and they don't talk about that type of stuff. And what's up with that? Michelle seemed to finally be overtaking her sadness. I asked Mom a while back why we aren't multi-billionaires since... Well, you can ask them anything, and they should know the answer. Or at least they'd be able to point you in the right direction for pretty much the same thing. But she said it didn't work that way, and that it was rude to ask in any event after all they'd been through and are, have been and still going through. I mean, someone is bound to have tried by now about, I don't know, winning the lotto numbers or where to find a, some buried treasure or... The stock, what the stock market's about to do, right? By now, it was obvious that Michelle was thoroughly uh, planted in the bargaining stage of her grief. But I could help uh, but smirk a little bit and give her a good-natured shrug. You would think so, yeah? I guess the departed had better things to do than figure how close they were to striking it rich while they were still able to.
Besides, from what I've experienced, they seem to be more inclined to just make statements rather than answer questions. Maybe their change affects their outlook? No one's really sure, and they aren't about to clear up the confusion for us. You should have heard Aunt Sue. I couldn't get two words in ed edgewise when she visited. Michelle, who had just uh, been taking a sip of coffee, narrowly avoided snorting her still half-full cup all over herself on the table. We tried to keep it quiet in respect to the late hour, though our parents probably still heard us laughing from the next floor. We, could, we continued to talk about various family members, guessing what flavor cake would best suit those still alive, and every now and again I'd take a shot at answering a question Michelle would field. Eventually we finished off the last of Grandma's cake and took the rest, uh, remains of our coffee back up to the bedroom to play some more video games and to help pass the time. It was closer to 1 a.m. when it finally did happen. We were still playing the same game, and Michelle's character had just received the dragon scale shawl from the lispy innkeeper when we felt it. A soft, cool, wafting breeze, like the kind felt from an overhead vent when the central AC kicks on, swept over us. It didn't seem to have a distinct direction, as if it came from everywhere and nowhere at once, making the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end in anticipation. This was an, an entirely unpleasant sensation, and was caused more from excitement than fear or dread. Look! Michelle gasped, pointing up at the corner of the room where the lines of two walls and the ceiling converged. There, an almost uh, uh, indefinable mass of small, silvery bubbles had started to form, seemingly pushed out of the intersection. They continued to multiply bunching and piling on top of one another, though never combining, until they were the size of a baseball. Then, one about the size of a pinky nail dislodged itself from the rest to float lazily across the room. Michelle and I watched its slow progress as it skimmed in front of a hanging bookshelf, danced between vinyl figurines of geeky icons and posed superheroes, and finally touched down on the LED screen that we'd be using to play our game. There was an odd distortion where it landed, like when you press a monitor too hard and cause a ripple of color as the pixels become disturbed and confused, and the bubble popped amid a small cloud of glittering motes. The barbarian sources that we had been playing as suddenly began to move on our own accord. A lot of contemporary video games have built-in inactivity scripts, that would kick in when the controls had been touched for a while. The player's characters would eventually start doing things like crossing their arms, tapping their feet in impatience, checking their gear and surroundings, or making thinly veiled comments about needing to be somewhere. Sure, sometimes they broke the fall, fourth wall doing this, but generally they didn't go so far as to completely turn towards the camera, wave, and say in an all too familiar voice that wasn't our barbarians, Hello, goslings. Nice to see you both again. Michelle and I both stared at the monitor, speechless. Though I'd lived through visitations a handful of times already, each and every one of them was uniquely different, and always a shock when it actually happened. G Grandma? I heard Michelle's voice beside me, small, uncertain, and on the verge of breaking. Our barbarian sorceress gave us a warm smile and nod, and I noticed that the normal violet shade of her eyes, uh, eye color had shifted to a warm brown that I remembered all too well. Now, now, she said, no need to be sad, my goslings. I'm here, so to speak, and we're all well, so there's no need for all that nonsense. A spoken nickname that our grandmother used to give us cracked my composure pretty thoroughly when I heard it. Though, enough that I felt uh, all the emotion that I'd been holding back threatened to give way. But her reassurance helped reinforce it with reason, and as they always had. So my eyes only got a little blurry instead of flooding the whole room with my crying. I could tell by the way that Michelle's shoulders had began to shake that she wasn't going to be as successful at plugging her tear ducts as I had been. 
So instead of, uh, so instead, I once again tried for a distraction. That elven robe looks good on you, Gran. Did you bulk up or something since we last saw you? The barbarian, who was temporarily a grandmother, looked down at herself, grinned and grunted in appreciative satisfaction, and made a few shows of flexing. Uh-huh. You know, I was just thinking the same thing. Do, do I look good for a 90-something-year-old or what? And is this real unicorn hair on the lining? I've got such great taste. Michelle picked out that goblin... Uh, that... <laughs> Michelle picked that out at the Goblin Market last week, I said, giving my sister an encouraging elbow nudge. She got it for a song, literally. Michelle seemed to have gotten over, gotten herself under control again. Yeah, but it was one of my best songs, though. I'll have to revisit the Muse of Underlick to get one, another one. After some quick consideration, Grandma the Barbarian announced, Well, I've got a bit of time... I'm glad my instincts were right. You two seem to really enjoy my cake. Why don't we take some, uh, take a quick trip to this muse and catch up a bit along the way? We spent the rest of the night chatting about family gossip and the news while Michelle guided our grandma to the redoubt of the Underlake muse. It took some time, but eventually Michelle warmed up to the uh, unusual situation. I talked about our upcoming trip to Chicago and how Cousin Joe had gotten lost riding the L for the, for the for the entire first year he had moved there. Michelle went into details about the new old books she'd found at a local thrift store the other day and how she couldn't believe her luck at how good a condition they were in. We both went on a rant about how our school classes were going, making sure to cover all the good, bad, and fugly details. All the while, Grandma the Barbarian traveled across verdant dales and dappled groves, making comments here and there while stealthily avoiding bandit camps, but allowing us to do most of the talking. Strangely enough, the game ran smoothly despite the inclusion of Grandma's spirit into the programming. We've, we eventually reached the Underlake Muse's chamber and have made the customary tribute of good cheese and wine. We were, uh, we were given the option of picking one of three songs to learn. The Raven's Ramble, The Swan's Serenade, and The Goose's Gamble. We picked the last one of these. No contest. When next I looked out of the bedroom window, I was surprised to see the sky was starting to get lighter. Daybreak was a couple hours away, so it was late, or rather early enough, that our parents might be waking before too long. Well, kids, began Grandma the Barbarian, and I knew with a heavy heart what was about to come next. It was a great visit, and I appreciate you sharing this part of your life with me. I had no idea how fun these kind of games could be, but now I begin to understand the appeal. But I must be off. I still have to give your Uncle uh, Uncle Bill a good earful uh, that he's been needing. Ciao for now, my goslings. And with that, there was another weird ripple of color, and the barbarian sorceress returned to her usual predetermined stance, her eyes shifting back from brown to their usual deep violet. For a time, Michelle and I simply sat quiet and unsure of what to do next. Michelle was the one who eventually broke the silence. That, that was actually really nice. Not what I was expecting, but nice all the same. Although, aren't we supposed to, uh, aren't they supposed to leave you with some sort of, I don't know, profound life advice or something? That was never grand style, I said, wrapping my arm around my sister's shoulder. She was always the live in the moment and cut the crap type. I'd have been more surprised if she'd drop any sort of wisdom bombshells on us. Glad she liked playing the game with us, though. Gran made a kick-ass barbarian sorceress. Michelle and I talked for a while longer, reminiscing about how her grandmother always knew exactly how to get her point across without ever having to say a word and wondering if we'd be able to do that ourselves at some point. Eventually, our exhaustion from the all-nighter caught up to us, and we laid back on the down comforters that covered the bed, letting our uh, sleep win its fight against us. 
The last thing I saw before drifting off was the blue sky outside the window and a passing flock of geese in a flying V formation that were headed to somewhere that only they knew. All right, so that was Dead Cakes and Appetizers. I hope you enjoyed that. Like I said, that was an early stage draft. As you can tell, I was kind of like editing it as I was reading it, but that's a good way of doing it sometimes. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that, and if you have any suggestions for edits or anything like that, feel free to leave me a comment. Um, but other than that, you guys have a great one, and I will see you hopefully before too long. See you later.